in progress on my fourth book, My God, He Plays Dice, How Albert Einstein Invented or Discovered Most of Today's Quantum Physics, although he was largely ignored by the great founders of quantum mechanics, Werner Heisenberg and Max Born, uh, Erwin Schrodinger, all of whom I've been studying carefully, uh, trying to get time to write this book, even at the same time I'm giving five lectures a week on problems in general, great problems in philosophy and physics and biology and psychology with my other books. Uh, but I've made some really wonderful progress. I'm working on the chapter on matrix mechanics, uh, and next up will be wave mechanics. Uh, the first theory, which was called a new quantum theory, uh, replacing the old theory of Bohr, Niels Bohr, <coughs> and his um, atom atomic model and so forth, the Bohr-Sommerfeld model, which imagined electron orbits going around a Rutherford, Lord Rutherford's nucleus with electrons uh, traveling around and then moving between the stationary states and giving off radiation when an electron falls from a high state to a low state and giving, emitting or absorbing uh, energy when a um, an atom jumps from a lower state to a higher state, having been excited by the local radiation field. All the old Bohr theory was uh, imagined that the uh, field of electricity and magnetism, uh, which was the radiation field, uh, according to Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, that that whole field was somehow a continuous field, as opposed to a discrete, in any way, a discrete, a set of discrete particles. Uh, now, it was Albert Einstein who had proved that matter came in discrete particles. Uh, before the 19th century, um, the, uh, there were, was a lot of question about the reality of, of atoms. Uh, of course, the idea of atoms had gone back to the Greeks with uh, Democritus and Leucippus, who argued that there's nothing out there but a void, and in the void there are discrete non-dividable elements of each important element that the world needs, and they call them atoms, because a means no and tom means divide or cut. No cutting these things. You get to a small enough size and particles must be uh, atoms. Uh, Atoms were disputed even through the 19th century when chemists began to find that matter combines in integer ratios. Uh, one sodium plus one chlorine makes sodium chloride an a, a molecule. And uh, for each oxygen in a water molecule, you need not one hydrogen, but two, famously H2O. The two hydrogens, the one oxygen, were integer numbers of these atoms getting involved in making the molecules of chemistry. So where does Einstein come in on this issue of uh, discreteness? It was his 1905 paper. Remember, 1905 was the miracle year for Albert Einstein. He published his Principle of Relativity. He published his uh, light quantum hypothesis, later to be called photons, which will be the subject of our lecture today. And he published a paper on Brownian motion, uh, the observed jiggling of, of liquid molecules in a liquid. Uh, observed uh, jiggling was actually for tiny little um, pollen particles, which were visible to the naked eye. And under his best microscope of the day, Robert Brown was able to look in and see that the little pollen molecules were jiggling. And um, it came to be thought that perhaps it was a sign that something even smaller and indivisible, invisible uh, was bumping around these visible uh, um, particles. And that's what Einstein proved in his paper in 1905. So here we have, and this is more or less ignored by the history of physics and chemistry. I, it's certainly not 
uh, never there. It's not excised, but it is very little known that it was Einstein who proved that particles, atoms, exist. Uh, and uh, his, his elder uh, mentor, uh, Ludwig Boltzmann, whose works were studied very carefully by Albert Einstein, and the first few papers of his work before 1905, Einstein uh, wrote about Boltzmann and uh, derived the statistical mechanical theories of Boltzmann independently of some of the writings of Boltzmann. Einstein had studied some, but not all. He didn't realize how much uh, that Boltzmann had done uh, with developing his theory of thermodynamics and the theory that the quantity known as entropy always increases. Uh, instead, Einstein derived those same results uh, for statistical mechanics, and so he was a great, um, he had a great insight into the workings of statistical properties of physics. Turned out to be very, very important in Einstein's work later. But in that same year, the so-called miracle year, 1905, where he produced the Brownian motion paper, the special relativity paper, he also produced his light quantum hypothesis paper. Most radical, he thought. He wrote a note to a friend saying the other papers were interesting, but this one was, quote, very revolutionary. Indeed, it was very revolutionary, and no one accepted the idea uh, that light came in particles, what we now call photons. Uh, light comes in quantities which are uh, localizable, uh, Einstein saw, they, they stay together. And even though when the normal view of light coming away from a light source, when we turn on a light source and we see the light going off in all directions, Einstein noticed that the energy of light seemed to be localized and traveling as a small particle in one location as it went off from uh, a center and off to a point where it would suddenly hit a piece of metal and eject an electron. And the electron, Einstein predicted, would then have the same energy as the light particle that originated in, in the, uh, from the light source, the same energy minus an amount which he called the amount of energy needed to eject the electron and get it to escape the metal. Uh, so-called work function, W, had to be expended. But beyond that, there would be uh, the same remaining energy in that, in that particle of light. Now, mind you, Einstein knew very well that the theory of light had been a wave theory because of the interference effects we've seen so often in our lectures. And yet, uh, he wanted to have this result that when the light traveled off and hit the metal plate and gave off an electron, it was localized. So what was to explain the wave theory that light goes off in all directions and the Einstein particle theory that light goes off in when found, when measured, it shows it's all together collected and able to eject an electron, the so-called photoelectric effect, which was only one of three important examples of Einstein's light quantum hypothesis, and yet most historians remember this paper as the photoelectric effect paper. Uh, indeed, even 15 years later, when Einstein was finally being given a Nobel Prize, they didn't give it to him for his relativity theory, either the principle of special relativity uh, nor the um, special uh, general relativity, which he'd worked out in 1916 and had finished by that time. Instead, the physicists gave Einstein the Nobel Prize, the committee of physicists gave him the prize for uh, the photoelectric effect, a small part of the paper on the light quantum hypothesis. And that had been in recent years, that is to say the prize committee was meeting in 1920 or so, and the fact of the explanation for the photoelectric effect had been confirmed by an American in the meantime. Um, and uh, as a result, uh, they were felt comfortable giving Einstein this Nobel Prize <coughs> for something that had been more or less established by that time. But 
the guy who established it didn't even believe that it was uh, the light quantum hypothesis that was causing the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect, in other words, was observed experimentally to have exactly the relationship between the frequency or energy of the photon, of the light quantum in those days, and the um, energy that was given off by the electron. Uh, hard to get this picture, but it's part of my thesis, my basic work on the life of Albert Einstein, to, to show you that he saw things that were happening that no one around him would accept because it was so radical until many, many years go by. <clears throat> I've been saying for some time that Niels Bohr, the great um, architect of the atom model, the model of the atom that included stationary states, jumps between those states, quantum jumps, and the absorption and emission of energy himself denied Einstein's light quantum idea, at least until 1924. And today I'm happy to say that I've been researching uh, the writings of the day, who was saying what to whom, and I find that Einstein talked to Heisenberg after a lecture that, I, that Heisenberg gave in Berlin, the University of Berlin, which is where Einstein's office was at the time. And uh, Einstein sat in on the lecture. An enormous number of very prominent physicists did sit in. And Heisenberg presented this amazing idea of matrix mechanics and uh, his ability to calculate the stationary states of Bohr. Those states had always been guessed at for one reason or another. Um, uh, the, one of the reasons given uh, for the work of Bohr locating those states uh, was by guessing at a, what he called a correspondence between the, the quantum theory of Bohr and the classical theory uh, that in the limit of high energy states, uh, almost out to escaping from the atom, that electron should correspond eventually in the limit of high, ener uh, high energy orbits with the classical theory. And that enabled Bohr to guess at certain relations. Um, another thing that Bohr did was to assume that the orbital paths of each electron, remember they're thought to be uh, planetary orbits going around a, a sun, where the sun is the nucleus and the planets are electrons. and um, sort of Keplerian orbits, uh, sometimes maybe not just circles, but, but ellipses, like Kepler had said about the way the planets uh, like Earth go around the sun and so forth. All of that theory was well argued and well thought of, even down to this day. It's frequently taught as the introduction to quantum mechanics. And to this day, the symbol of an atom has a little big lump in the middle and then some things going around in orbits, you know, the famous picture of an atom. Okay, so Einstein had predicted or proved that the atom theory of John Dalton and other chemists, Lavoisier and others throughout the 19th century, who had begun to assume atoms, uh, that that theory was correct. He then, in the same year, in a separate paper, written, submitted just a month apart or so, two months, um, Einstein argued his very revolutionary hypothesis that light too must come in particles because it seems to travel from one place uh, to another place without losing its energy uh, in any way, even though the description of its travel is thought to be wave-like by the wave theory of light, it's also thought to be a particle because it can take all its energy and locate it in one ejection of an electron in the photoelectric effect. Okay, so now um, that's all background to the year 1925-26. Uh, <coughs> actually, we have 24 when Niels Bohr wrote a paper with uh, a colleague in Copenhagen, Hendrik Kramers, and another colleague who had visited Copenhagen from MIT, uh, the American John Slater, who wrote really wonderfully on wave mechanics and quantum mechanics later years, one of the books I used back uh, many years ago. Um, these three, Bohr, Cromers, and Slater, published a paper in which they explicitly denied Einstein's 
photon, light quantum hypothesis. It was about to be called the photon, I believe, around that time by an American chemist named Gilbert Lewis. Um, but this paper shows, proves, that Bohr does not believe Einstein. Almost 20 years later, he's still not accepting Einstein's theory. But, and it may be that he never did, because he's a wishy-washy, um, obscure clarity, uh, is a word described, describing um, Bohr's uh, papers by his very good friends. Uh, it seems somehow to be sentences are extremely dense and weird, and you wonder exactly what it is he's driving at. <coughs> and he famously spent weeks pouring over uh, the way to say things, the right, getting the, the right words, would, which would absolutely make everything perfectly clear. Uh, in many ways, I believe Niels Bohr was very influenced by logical positivism and what's called analytic language philosophy in those days, uh, and wanted very much to be a philosopher. And in those days, philosophers thought the problem with philosophical understanding of nature was uh, the problem of getting our concepts correctly stated, that we need a clear language. And when we get the language clear, we will then understand the, wor the natural world. To me, that was a, a reasonable project by people who had little more to go on in those days, but talking to one another and arguing and trying to debate using logic, using reason, thinking themselves through to what must be going on in the world, comparing all their perceptions, their sense data, and whether the senses were reaching past them to the so-called things themselves that was thought by Kant to be a world beyond uh, our senses. Uh, that actually came down from the British empiricists, Locke and Hume and Berkeley, who thought we could be sure that we were getting these sense perceptions, but we couldn't be sure of what it was behind the sense data that was creating the sense data in our eyes and our ears and so forth. So there was this skepticism. I mean, Hume was actually a great skeptic, uh, following on the ideas of the, uh, the Greek skeptics that it's rather difficult to make an argument which will prove something about the world. The world is to be understood experimentally by observing the world. And uh, even then, the observations may be hallucinations. Uh, how do we know we're not dreaming at the moment? We, and I must say, uh, I think it's the case that many of the great theories of science and theories of society and theories of religion, for example, probably originated as dreams, creative new thoughts in the minds of people who were, um, my professor Ducasse at, at Brown was fascinated by the question of hallucinogenic drugs uh, well before Tim Leary and the LSD phenomena at Harvard. He was out taking mescaline and going to societies where people claimed that by ingesting certain things they would have fantastic thoughts and visions and would understand the world and, you know, realize that the world is one and we are one and everything is all together, as the Beatles might have sung about it. Uh, so whether or not ideas could be expressed in words, even in the most clear concepts, and then actually get to knowing things was a question uh, in the 19th century. Very strong question. It went back to the Greeks. They were skeptics and they argued with the Stoics and made the Stoics sound foolish. Uh, in the end of the day, it seems to me it's the skeptics who were uh, setting up foolish paradoxes uh, that claimed to show that we couldn't know anything. The skeptics, by the way, uh, were the remainders. I'm grabbing for a book over here. The skeptics were a remainder of the great Platonic Academy, which, of course, had laid down ideas of truth and goodness and beauty and hope for things that must be true because they, they're truths of an ideal world, a platonic realm beyond the empirical, beyond the uh, imitation world uh, that we live in. Uh, now these things are discussed in my Great Problems book and even more uh, discussed in my metaphysics book, Problems, Paradoxes, and Puzzles, Solved? Question mark. That's for you to decide.
Uh, but this issue of being a skeptic goes all the way back to the Greeks, comes down to Hume. The Skeptical Academy finally had a, a head of the Academy, Inesidemus. No, maybe it's another Greek name that I'm not quite remembering, but with any, without a doubt, there came a, a head of the Skeptical Academy, the Platonic Academy of his day, who said, well, we, we can't prove that we know nothing because it's self-contradictory. Because if we think we know nothing, as Socrates used to go around saying, uh, that is a claim to know something, namely that we know nothing. And he developed this early Greek, an idea called mitigated skepticism, which is the one we work with today. Science basically never claims to prove everything, but to have established a set of facts that's the most consistent overarching assembly of ideas that explains the nature of reality. It can't claim to know it perfectly. Uh, even the Greeks tried to argue that one cannot know things and that skepticism remains. The idea that we cut it off at some point. We can say things are relative, but not everything is relative. Something here, something in the package must be kind of real and, uh, and objectively real. Uh, David Hume took the same position um, in his dialogues on the natural religion. I've forgotten the title exactly. They're very much like what uh, Cicero, Cicero wrote in his early dialogues. And they, they circle around this issue of whether or not we ever believe something that is true of the world, as opposed to just our believing it, having an opinion and so forth. OK, let's get back now, though, to uh, our topic today. And it's 1925, 1926, and Werner Heisenberg uh, has been working on a problem of describing the spectral line intensities of those lines, uh, these uh, emitted, uh, absorbed energies and emitted energies when these electrons jump up and down among the stationary states of the Bohr atom. And um, I'll just switch the uh, screen for a moment and take a look at this one. Here's the uh, page on Werner Heisenberg. And I want you to know, by the way, that when I set up um, my blog post in the morning, put it out ahead of the lecture, there you can read what we're going to be doing today. Those of you who want to kind of get ahead of the lecture and some familiarity with some of the technical things that are in it, the, the pages of my website, informationphilosopher.com, are loaded with... Um, with information. Here, here I'll just back off for a moment and take a look at the website as a whole. Remember that down the left is the work on all sorts of philosophers and scientists. So this Werner Heisenberg page is under the scientist section. And um, these drop down menus can give you access to the specific problems of my problems book, uh, the problem of knowledge, the problem of free will, the problem uh, philosophy of mind, chance and quantum ideas, which are going to be over on the right hand side. And there are lots of them. We're going to deal with just one of them today. And that's the problem of entanglement, which was first discovered, explained, and at the time not at all understood by physicists in 1935 by Einstein. But that's going to be seven or eight years later after our, our, our lecture today, which is about 1925-1926. Uh, so let me take this to full screen and try to work through just the first couple of paragraphs of this. In 1925, Werner Heisenberg, and I should have put him first rather than Max Born, and Pasquale Jordan, who was a young assistant to Born at Göttingen, they formulated their matrix mechanics version of quantum mechanics as a superior formulation of Niels Bohr's old quantum theory, old quantum theory. This matrix mechanics confirmed discrete states, the stationary states that Bohr had hypothesized, and the qu quantum jumps of electrons between the energy levels with the emission or absorption of radiation. But they did not yet accept today's standard textbook view that the radiation is also discrete. And in the form of Albert Einstein's light quanta, the localized particles that are about to be renamed photons by Gilbert Lewis, in late 1926. And then I just mentioned that in early 1926, Schrodinger developed an alternative formulation of quantum mechanics that he called wave mechanics. 
Schrodinger himself really disliked the idea of discontinuous quantum jumps. His wave theory was a continuous theory, but it predicted the same energy levels and was otherwise identical to the discrete theory and its predictions. Indeed, Schrodinger himself proved that matrix mechanics and his wave mechanics were isomorphic theories. That is to say, they produced exactly the same results. It seems, looking back on it, quite astonishing that within a few months' time, this extraordinarily complicated matrix mechanics, which involved this notion of two matrices that you can't multiply together and have them be giving the same result if you multiply A by B, you get one result. If you multiply B by A, which should be AB equals BA, it doesn't in quantum mechanics. And it gives rise to this strange quantum of action quantity, which is the quantum condition, it's called. It's the fundamental thing that leads to discreteness, leads to chance, among other things, and it leads to our modern theory of quantum mechanics. Um, OK, let's go back to our little page today on what happened then uh, shortly after um, Heisenberg did his uh, matrix theory. Now, I've tried to make this a little more readable, and believe it or not, I couldn't get my blog, which is WordPress, to uh, create larger fonts. Uh, I put in a font tag and made it larger, and I couldn't do it. So I know I've been trying to tell you I'd like to make these screen, this particular screen a little easier for you to read. Uh, what I've come up with is just to bold it, or bold at least parts of it. So what's bolded here is the thing that Heisenberg talked to Einstein about in 1926. It's springtime. Uh, Heisenberg has been invited to the University of Berlin to speak about his matrix mechanics. And uh, Heisenberg tells us in his English translation is what I'm using here, uh, from a book called Physics and Reality, I think. Heisenberg tells us, let me again take this to full screen so we go through. Heisenberg tells us that Einstein asked him about Einstein's theory of light quanta, okay? Then called photons, I think, just about that time. At that time, Einstein's radical hypothesis of light quanta was 21 years old, went back to 1905 and had been accepted by almost all physicists because it had explained the Compton effect in which um, light particles bounce off uh, material particles as if they're both particles and they obey the laws of collisions between particles. That's then been the first uh, really deep uh, clarification and, and belief that Einstein had it right. But ironically, Compton himself did not believe it. It said, a, a bridge too far, he said, something like, I, I don't think we can go that far. But we do know that there seems to be a collision that when a, a, a light quantum comes in and bumps into an uh, electron, the little equations of how they bounce off one another, the angles at which they bounce off one another, are exactly the same angles as if the light was a particle. But mind you, others took that to be proof of Einstein's work. Compton himself wouldn't go there for another couple of years. Okay, so um, it also, in 1924, had disproved the bohr cromer slater theory, and I thought this was the last time that Bohr uh, denied uh, quant light quanta, because it did. It also, the BKS theory, it's called, denied uh, the conservation of energy and Einstein is a big believer in conservation principles like uh, matter is conserved or matter and energy combined is conserved since his 1906 work in which he wrote E equals mc squared. Energy is convertible into matter. Matter convertible into energy. When a, an atom absorbs uh, light energy, Einstein said, it must weigh more if you could put it on a scale. And he even went so far as to say that light traveling by the sun, although it has no mass, it has an energy equivalent mass. From the formula, the energy equivalent mass is the energy divided by the velocity of light squared. And he therefore predicted that the mass of the sun would exert a gravitational pull on the light coming from behind, and so as the light came around, it would curve, 
And we would think that the star that it came from is farther away in, from the sun than it is when the sun isn't there. Arthur Stanley Eddington went out in 1919. The war is sort of still on, um, World War I. And he establishes Einstein's correct uh, prediction that uh, light is curved, uh, that paths are curved in space is the way it finally became interpreted. But anyway, Bohr, Cromers, and Slater had denied uh, the light quanta, even though the young John Slater, who came from MIT, had been reading and studying Einstein's theory, and it was his theory that he brought to Copenhagen. Uh, he added in the theory, though, the notion of virtual oscillators, which really attracted Cromers and uh, Bohr, Bohr. And it turns out Bohr and Cromers took the young American physicist paper ideas, went into another room, and wrote the entire paper called Bohr Cromers Later. Later, uh, later years later said he thought he was treated horribly, that they would take his ideas, selectively picking the one they liked, and putting it in a paper with his name on it. Okay, but now that was I at the time I thought I knew Bohr didn't believe in uh, light quanta. Now, today, I'm going to show you that uh, Bohr's student, uh, Werner Heisenberg, also doesn't accept light quanta in work I've just discovered and added to my web page. You can go and see that on the web page for Heisenberg, or um, that's where I have it at the moment. I eventually will move it onto the my big Albert Einstein page, which is growing and growing and becoming the material for my book. Okay, so here he has. Here uh, Einstein is saying to Heisenberg about his new theory. But what happens during the emission of light, he asks. As you know, I suggested that when an atom drops suddenly from one stationary energy value to the next, it emits the energy difference as an energy packet, a so-called light quantum. In that case, we have a particularly clear example of discontinuity. Do you think that my conception is correct? Or can you describe the transition from one station, stationary state to another in a more precise way, says Albert Einstein. Here's Heisenberg. In my reply, I must have said something like this. And let me bring this up to the screen here as I read it. And I've got a little um, parenthetical phrase that says, Heisenberg is going to say simply that he and Bohr, quote, don't know. He can't say that he believes in light, Einstein's light quanta. Although by this time, as we just explained, most quantum physicists had come to accept the idea of photons or light quanta as particles as well as having wave properties. And that, of course, is going to be the a stumbling block for, uh, for Heisenberg. So Heisenberg replies, Bohr has taught me that one cannot describe this process by means of the traditional concepts, that is, as a process in time and space. With that, of course, we've said very little, no more, in fact, than that we do not know. Whether or not I believe or I should believe in light quanta, I cannot say at this stage. Radiation quite obviously involves the discontinuous elements to which you refer as light quanta. Uh, let's see, I don't want to do that. I'll cancel that page. Um, so Heisenberg could not at that time see how his quantum mechanics, with its emphasis on the material particle properties of energy and momentum, can explain the wave properties, uh, which Bohr, we'll learn, see as described in terms of the complementary properties of space and time. <clears throat> now this gets quite technical, but Bohr in the next couple years, uh, by 1927, will have developed this theory called complementarity in which everything is complementary to something else, okay? Uh, ideas and material uh, world may be a kind of complementary thing that goes way back. The mind and the body is kind of a complementary thing. Many others, I've, I've um, identified uh, dozens and dozens of, of dualities or dualisms on my page on dualisms. I think I may have shown them once before. But what we here have here is that Bohr wants to have space and time be one thing and momentum and energy another. And Heisenberg loves to talk about particles banging into one another and measuring their momentum and measuring their energy. Um, and he doesn't like the discussions about waves. 
Uh, there's a story about how he failed his qualifying exam uh, as, a, as a graduate student when he couldn't under explain the resolving power of a microscope and exactly how the what the waves had to do with what optics had to do with measurements uh, I'll be putting that into the book so here um, uh, Heisenberg continues on the other hand there is a continuous element which appears for instance in interference phenomena and there we are into our wave fringes and interference and which is much more simply described by the wave theory of light. But you are, of course, quite right, he says to Einstein, to ask whether quantum mechanics has anything new to say on these terribly difficult problems. I believe that we may at least hope that it will one day. I could, for instance, uh, says Heisenberg, imagine that we should obtain an interesting answer if we considered the energy fluctuations of an atom during reactions with other atoms or with the radiation field, if the energy should change discontinuously, as we expect from your theory of light quanta, then the fluctuation, or in more precise mathematical terms, the mean score fluctuation, would be greater than if the energy changed continuously. I'm inclined to believe that quantum mechanics would lead to the greater value, and so establish the discontinuity. On the other hand, the continuous element which appears in interference experiments must also be taken into account. Perhaps one must imagine the transitions from one stationary to the state as so many fade-outs in a film. The change is not sudden. One picture gradually fades while the, other, the next comes into focus so that for a time both pictures become confused and one does not know which is which. Similarly, there well, may well be an intermediate state in which we cannot tell whether an atom is in the upper or the lower state. All kind of interesting. Uh, to me, the word confused there is very important. It's Heisenberg who's confused and has these two theories, the wave theory, which, by the way, at the time of this lecture, had already been explained by Erwin Schrodinger, but it's left out of uh, Heisenberg's discussion of these problems. So uh, I say Einstein is quite correct that Heisenberg is talking, oh, and I see this refers to what's about to come up in the next section, about what we subjectively know, the epistemology, and not about what is happening in objective uh, reality, uh, the ontology. So let's listen to that. You're moving on very thin ice, Einstein warned me, for you are suddenly speaking of what we know about nature and no longer about what nature really does. In science, we ought to be concerned solely with what nature does. It might very well be that you and I know quite different things about nature, Einstein is telling him. But who would be interested in that? Perhaps you and I alone. To everyone else, you know, our thoughts are a matter of complete indifference. In other words, if your theory is right, you'll have to tell me sooner or later what the atom does when it passes from one stationary state to the next. Okay, so here we have Einstein challenging this young man and um, seeing that he really is focusing on what uh, we know rather than what is actually happening. This will become the cornerstone of the so-called Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics. Don't try to visualize or talk about what is going on in the, uh, in the experiment. Um, and I see that I've... I've um, wanted to add a little more here. I've been working on this this morning. I see I didn't quite finish. Uh, and so I might want to go to, uh, let me ch change to this screen and bring it up. Uh, let's see, a Tim. Uh, back to Heisenberg's page. What I'm going to do here is add slash and type in talk underscore with underscore E-I-N-S-T-E-I-N. -E if I get that right, it's always difficult to type when I'm doing something important. Uh, I've got talk with Einstein and I've missed out a letter A. I see. Let's see if I can get that in there. And then I'm going to copy that and use it to open another page so I can leave Heisenberg's page behind. And I'll paste that in over here. And I didn't get it. 
Well, that's unfortunate. We'll go back to this one. This is what I wanted to copy. See how clumsy I am with my uh, computer skills. And try it again. No, I think I have it. And I'll return. And here's Heisenberg's talk with Einstein. Now, this is what we've just been reading in selection on my blog page. But I want to remind you that uh, the blog is just a few paragraphs that I put up so as an introduction to the lecture. So what I'm going to do here is scroll down. And here I have the complete uh, talk with Einstein, which is a chapter in the book called Physics and Reality. And here in a side note, I mentioned that Heisenberg didn't accept Einstein's 1905 idea. That is going to be the point I'm, I'm trying to establish. Uh, some talk about Bohr's correspondence principle. Here, Heisenberg is talking about the summit term of 1925. And he'd worked with Hendrik Kramers, the, the person in the Bohr-Kramers-Slater theory, which failed completely. And then he went on and on. So we get down to uh, being at Göttingen, where Max Born and Pasquale Jordan had took stock of the new possibilities that he'd brought to them. And at the time, the University of Berlin was considered the stronghold of physics in Germany. With Planck was there, Einstein was there, von Laue and Nernst. Nernst was a great fan of Einstein's work and was one of the earliest ones to accept the implications of the light quantum hypothesis. Uh, so on the way, he had, so uh, in the spring of 1926, we didn't see that earlier, I was invited to address this distinguished body on the new, his new quantum mechanics. And since this was my first chance to meet so many famous men, I took good care to give a clear account. I apparently managed to arouse Einstein's interest, for he invited me to walk home with him so that we might discuss these new ideas at greater length. On the way, he asked about my studies, and then I think I quoted this earlier, but maybe not. What you have told us sounds, says Einstein, sounds extremely strange. You assume the existence of electrons inside the atom, and you're probably quite right to do so, but you refuse to consider their orbits. Even though we can observe electron tracks in a cloud chamber, as well known a cloud chamber is a, a vapor of liquid, uh, alcohol often, and when we get charged particles like electrons and others, fired into the cloud chamber, we see this stream of we're actually seeing little water droplets collecting along the ionization path. In any case, we see tracks. I should very much like to hear more about your reasons for making you know, strange assumptions, Einstein says to, uh, to Heisenberg. Heisenberg replies, we cannot observe electron orbits inside the atom, I must have replied. But the radiation which an atom emits during discharges enables us to deduce the frequencies and corresponding amplitudes of its electrons. So even in the older wave physics, wave numbers and amplitudes, that's frequency and amplitude, could be considered substitutes for the orbits. So I thought, since a good theory must be based on directly observable magnitudes, I thought it more fitting to restrict myself to these treating them as representatives of the electron orbits. And Heisenberg famously said, we cannot observe the orbits. Therefore, let's forget them and say they're unobservable and maybe they don't even exist. This is the part where he goes too far. Um, Einstein and he then go back and forth on whether uh, you could really assume that only observable magnitudes go in a theory. And I'm going to skip by this. But they both agree that all observations begin as measurements. Uh, and then my argument is the, those measurements are recorded in the apparatus before they're seen by the experimenter. Today, in fact, measurements are made, and it may be weeks before the data analysis is finished and the experimenter knows the outcome of the experiment. But in those days, they thought that the consciousness of the observer was involved right there at the measurement, and it was only when the consciousness of the observer had learned of the measurement that it actually became real. That's a subject for another day, as I say, which are later sensed by the experimenter and recorded in the experimenter's conscious memory. My model of the experience recorder and reproducer will be used here. So here they talk back and forth, and I believe that when Heisenberg 
quotes Einstein, he's using Niels Bohr's philosophical talk about phenomena and consciousness, and that's the whole idea that it isn't a measurement until it's in the consciousness of the observer. So I want to go beyond all of that, although I think it's very interesting. And I want to get to uh, beyond, Einstein says, I don't want to sound like a naive realist, but he, Einstein, does believe in an objective reality. And what he's saying to Heisenberg is, I agree, uh, you must agree, I can't observe these things that are going on. Einstein says, you tell me you can't observe them, I accept that you can't observe them. But that is no reason to go on and claim they do not exist. No reason to claim when the, when the particle's moving, it doesn't have a path, just because we can't measure the path, okay? And that's, uh, that's the point of our talk title today. I, I, Einstein is saying, what, no path? So let's see where he really does say that. He talks about, um, we know perfectly well what the word observe means. And um, he talks about the difference between objective and a subjective phenomena and so forth. Um, I'm going to instead go by that. But mind you, this page, which is uh, on the Heisenberg page, uh, can give you yourself a chance to read through this, to me, extremely important conversation between two guys on two sides of this real bi really big argument uh, that starts here and it winds up confused for the next 80 years, uh, more, 1926, where 90 years, 1992 years to today. So um, Einstein tells him, in that case, however, you will also have to say in a cloud chamber, we can't observe the path of the electrons. At the same time, you claim that there are no electron paths inside the atom. This is obvious nonsense, says Einstein, for you can't possibly get rid of this path simply by restricting the space in which the electron moves to being inside the atom and then point out that we can't measure anything inside the atom. It's too small. Our, our equipment can't get in there. In fact, Einstein is fam um, Heisenberg is famous for describing a microscope in which when you try to look in and see the particle, you hit the particle and disturb it, knock it away, and that leads to uncertainty in its position. Because if you try to look at it with a long wave with low energy, you sort of get a good measurement, but it's, it's diffuse, so you don't know where it is. If you increase the energy of the light looking in, it bangs the particle even harder. So now, after you hit it, it's, it's gone. This was a complete um, mistaken view of what the basis is for the uncertainty principle. As Niels Bohr will point out to uh, Heisenberg later on in 1927, it was a great embarrassment for Heisenberg to be corrected by his uh, mentor, Bohr. And as I may have mentioned, uh, when Heisenberg took his qualifying exam to get his PhD, he couldn't explain the resolving power of a microscope. Uh, somehow this young man never really did get hold of a, the meaning of, of waves going through and, and interfering with one another and so forth. That will, I hope, turn out to be an important element in my book. Not only proving that Einstein has a really good sense of what goes on in a, quote, objective reality, uh, that just because we can't see the path doesn't mean there wasn't a path between here and there for a particle uh, because it has to conserve its matter and it never disappears and reappears or anything like that. That's what Einstein was thinking. Um, so Heisenberg says, I tried to come to the defense of the new mechanics, the new quantum mechanics. For the time being, we have no idea in what language we must speak about the processes inside the atom. This is Bohr talking. It's all about language, analytic language philosophy. Getting the words right will get us to understand the world. I'm afraid that's been a great error for the whole 20th century. I say instead we must gather information about what's going on and what information processes are going on at the microscopic level, and then we have a better chance of understanding. It's not going to be language. So um, Heisenberg says, true, we have a mathematical language, but he also says uh, we don't know how, the question is how this language is related to that of classical physics. And of course, we need this connection to classical because he says, when it comes to experiments, we invariably speak in the traditional language. He says, 
Hence, I cannot really claim that we've understood quantum mechanics. Um, I assume that the mathematical scheme works, but no link with our traditional language has been established so far. And until that has been done, we can't hope to speak of the path of the electron in the cloud chamber without inner contradictions. And I point out over here, he's saying, we cannot understand quantum mechanics until we can explain it using our traditional classic language to describe the path of an electron. That is a philosophical, a philosophical idea from language philosophy being used by Bohr and now by Heisenberg as if somehow we need words before we can ever understand quantum physics. And Heisenberg says, oh, very well, I'll accept that. We'll talk about it again in a few years' time. So um, he says, and I think probably this is worth uh, we now see in the next paragraph, we're coming to where I began, but what happens during the emission of light? So Einstein says, quantum theory, as you have expounded it in your lecture, has two distinct faces. Let me bring that, whoops, not that one, let this one, bring it up to the screen. Uh, on the one hand, as Bohr himself has rightly stressed, it explains the stability of the atom. It causes the same forms of an atom to re reappear time and reappear time and again. On the other hand, it explains that strange discontinuity or inconstancy of nature which we observe quite clearly when we watch flashes of light on a scintillation screen. Those are clearly Einstein's light quanta. These two aspects are obviously connected. In your quantum mechanics, you will have to take both into account. For instance, when you speak of the emission of light by atoms, you, cannot, you can calculate the discrete energy values of the stationary states. Your theory can thus account for the stability of certain forms that cannot merge continuously into one another, but must differ by finite amounts and seem capable of permanent reformation. And at this point, we come back to uh, where we open, where Einstein says, but what happens during the emission of light? And here, Einstein has to remind this young man of a theory that's been out there in the world for 21 years. And this is a student of Bohr, companion of Bohr, who in 1926 says, uh, did I quote that already? I don't know whether I can believe, and here it is. Uh, with, with what Bohr has taught me, by means of the traditional language concepts, uh, is, is something. But with that, he says, we've said very little. No more, in fact, than that we do not know. That's the hallmark to me of Copenhagen. Whether or not I should believe in light quanta, I cannot say at this stage. So what have we shown today? That Einstein challenges Heisenberg to explain how light quanta fits into his theory, and Heisenberg can only reply, Bohr and I do not know. That to me now is the evidence I've just found. Maybe others have seen it, but as I work through this theory now, 90 years later, it's clear to me that Niels Bohr always fought against the idea of light quanta because they couldn't explain interference. And so I've developed these visual diagrams um, uh, of how it is that uh, the wave function is a function of the container that it's in the container for the hydrogen atom is the hydrogen nucleus potential energy holding on to the electron. We're going to go into this into future lectures. And um, Einstein is challenging him, and he's telling Einstein, I don't really know whether we accept quanta yet. And I know we'll use that in the book to show that Niels Bohr never bought the idea of light quanta as, as late or had not, at least as late as 1926. And on the other hand, Einstein is telling Heisenberg, surely there is a path. And if it's a path, something very extraordinary happens. Einstein is saying, I believe that you can imagine a continuous path, whether it's an electron orbit, or it's in two entangled particles separating, or in general, something going into the two-slit experiment, it has a path even if we do not know the path. So in the context of the two-slit experiment, we're going to say, let's see if I've got that here. Uh, here's the two-slit. 
And let me shrink it a bit. Control minus minus. Uh, this is probably not the great, greatest illustration until we get to one you're familiar with. Here's the one that the we can see the particle as having a path and going into one of the let's see one of the slits. And because the probability amplitude, this is the wave function evaluated at all, all inside this container, it will behave according to the probabilities given by the wave and produce those interference patterns. Now, we don't have much more time today. I'm going to go into this <laughs> ad nauseum at some level until I believe I've done my best to explain it to you because it is different from what is normally described in quantum mechanics textbooks and even in quantum and especially in quantum mechanics popular lectures which portray this as a complete mystery. Feynman said it contains the only mystery and I agree with this in the sense that it's totally mysterious how this pure abstract information that we talked about yesterday of the wave function how immaterial information can possibly influence a material particle and, and cause it statistically to array itself up in this interference pattern. And I point out it's similar to the information in the mind, which is immaterial information, and how it can be something that leads us to act. How can, as Descartes put it, an immaterial mind move a material body? That is a major part of my research and my thinking about how it is, what's the relationship between abstract information and material, the material world. I can just want to then show you one more thing, and that's uh, here. And here's a diagram I'm showing that entanglement concept that Einstein wrote about in 1935. This is start again in just a moment in which two particles leave the center travel out as waves so we don't know exactly where they are and then suddenly when they appear Alice on the left sees it with a spin up electron and Bob on the right sees it as a spin down electron and the question becomes how can we possibly know these uh, have these two things which are random things and distant from one another be so perfectly coordinated so that one is up and one is down okay well, what I want to do here is uh, move forward to say the way the quantum physicists and the way uh, Heisenberg wants to talk about this is to say that uh, in the, in, as, as they're traveling apart from the center where they start with one up and one down as they travel from the center they are in an intermediate unknown state and then they suddenly at the end one is up and the other is down well that's a mystery they say how can it be that they could been either both up or both down or and yet when they come out with one up and one down to satisfy the laws of um, uh, or, or to show us this puzzle of entanglement how can they remain knowledgeable arguably they say it must be that when Alice measures it on the left that influences the measurement by Bob on the right but that is an error and let me show you what I think uh, is maybe going on Here's Einstein's thinking in my representation of his work. What if the particles have a path and they maintain their up and down the whole time as they travel? When you get to the end, they obviously uh, are one up and one down because that is they, they are conserving their spin along with their momentum along the path. Well, we're running out of time today, but I want to thank you for paying attention and listening to this very complicated subject. Uh, maybe if I work on this enough months or years, get it into my website and then get it into my books, we can get a lot of other people thinking about this along with us. But for now, uh, it's just you and me and appreciate your being here as always. And I look forward to your being back again on Monday. I'll sign off right here. Thank you.